Oops. Alrighty. Um, so I hope everyone had a nice reading week. Um, so test one, or the midterm, has been graded. Um, so the average is 71%, so good. Um, and I think Jason was Jason and I were quite pleased with how the class did overall. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we hand those back at the end of the class today, though. Um, and so just as a reminder, um, you all have your research essays to be working on. Um, so pretty much at this point, you just have the, the research essay and then the final exam. Damn. Um, and so tomorrow we have uh, our next tutorial, and that one will be focused on getting you prepped for writing uh, the research essay. Um, so it will be uh, a writing tutorial that Jason has been crafting all term. Um, so it will be the expectations are high. And I'm kidding, but, but uh, it'll be it'll be good. Um, thanks as well for your feedback on the midterm. Um, I always like asking some sort of formative questions, um, and so uh, I'm happy to see that most of you are enjoying the class. Um, however, there are a couple of themes that uh, came up that I'll try to improve upon. Um, so drawing more explicit connections to the readings, um, I, I'll try to do that. Um, and I will try to slow down at points. Um, so one benefit, not to, not to uh, neutralize my own deviance, as we'll see the theme of today, but um, one benefit of having the web option, at least, is if I am going a little bit fast, then you can watch it again and slow it down. Um, but I will still try to, of course, uh, engage in slightly better pacing. Um, so this week, we look at uh, what are called cultural theories. Um, so we move a little bit away from the, the, you know, all the early foundational work we've done, kind of going back and forth through different structural explanations, you know, looking at you know, to what extent were people being positivistic or linked to the classical school choice theories and all of that. Um, we finished off with Travis Hershey writing about social control theory, kind of blending a lot of the other theories. Um, and now we move into the realm of kind of everyday life and more fun deviance. Um, so the course, I think, was a natural breaking point here. Um, you'll see, start this week kind of provi pro provides the foundation for all the other weeks moving forward. Um, you'll see kind of two questions, or, or the two theories uh, that are guiding us are differential association theory, um, and then kind of a little bit more emphasized and, and more the, the one of these two which we'll be more directly engaged with for the rest of the, for the, rest of the term, um, techniques of neutralization. Um, so my own work on pedophilia uses that concept. Um, the uh, article we'll be reading on hitmen uses that. Um, an article on persistent robbers uh, by Jack Katz. Uh, many articles and, and an article on um, kind of stealing and conniving bread salesmen um, uses that concept as well, although a little bit differently. Um, so this week I just want to get us all oriented um, within these two theories. Um, and I think going forward to a lot of the, the kind of uh, comments I saw on the midterm, um, I think those will kind of be automatically addressed, uh, given that this term we are dealing with uh, far fewer theories. Um, and the readings, I think, are um, more fun and more in-depth in terms of uh, empirical evidence rather than um, theoretical claims. Um, so I think we can be a little bit more kind of cognitively anchored this term. We've done all of the big kind of foundation work, um, and now we can get more into the fun of deviance, which is really why, I te why I'm teaching this course. Um, okay, so Edward Sutherland, or Edwin Sutherland, sorry, um, was a key figure, much like Hershey, although writing earlier. Um, and I mean like Hershey in that he was very frustrated uh, with the status quo of criminology and the sociology of deviance of his time. Um, he was writing in like the 30s, 40s, and 50s, so like Merton. Um, but 
he was responding to those early positivists that we have talked about before, so people like Lombroso. Um, and he said, you know what, we need to, to actually not be super concerned with why people deviate. You know, remember, like, that was the big positivistic question, right? You were thinking, like, okay, we want to know why people are doing this, because we want to stop them from doing it. Um, and instead, he was interested in really just how they did it. Um, so part of why this week is called the Cultural Week, as we'll see, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, um, but this distinction between um, not being interested in why and only being interested in how really marked a major turning point in criminology and the sociology of deviance, where people now would see crime and deviance as just cultural. So, rather than see it as pathological, um, he depathologizes this and says, you know what, let's draw from the rational school, the classical school. Uh, remember its big insight was we need to reform society because somehow people have come to think that crime and deviance pay. Um, you know, everyone's rational, we're all equal, there's no weirdos or whatever, people are just adapting to the environment. Um, and so he draws on that really to say, you know what, if someone is deviating, it's because it makes sense to them and they probably learned it. Um, so learning culture and learning crime and deviance as cultural values um, is the key kind of theoretical construct um, for the rest of this for the rest of this term. Um, we'll see that what he calls differential association, however, um, is quite different from what Sykes and Matza argue with techniques of neutralization. Um, but they both kind of assume the same thing: basically that crime and deviance are cultural. They're things that we learn. We can learn them from peers, we learn them from mentors, we learn them from um, anyone around us, we learn them from books, we learn about them from books, um, and our choices to do that are largely rational and defined by our own experiences and identities. Um, so again, moves away from questions of why. The why is pretty simple. Well, why do we engage in crime? For the same reasons why we go to school, why we watch movies, um, they're just things that we do, that we've learned, that make sense to us. Um, so a little bit vague and broad, as we'll see, but, but um, less concerned there. Um, so crime and deviance here are cultural activities in the same way, again, as going to school is simply what you do, going to work, having friends, you know, washing your hair, whatever. Um, so here, he depathologizes crime, I've put there, and again, ultimately is interested now, because it's one thing to just say, oh, okay, well, crime and deviance are just learned. Um, but his theory is all about unpacking, and you'll see there's all these nine assumptions and all of these things. You don't need to know all of those, but um, he goes in depth on how people do this. So he's saying, I'm not interested in why, I'm interested in how, and I'm going to develop this theory, differential association, um, to show you how how people do that. Yep. So like, when he, does he mean how as in like how they learn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's just interested in say, let's say someone becomes a murderer, someone becomes um, a bank robber. Um, he just says, what's, it, what's if, if we're operating under the assumption that crime and deviance are learned, um, then if we do want to make any sort of intervention, um, it wouldn't be about, you know, weeding out certain kinds of people or, you know, giving them brain training or anything, but it would be seeing, okay, people are learning to do murder or learning to, ban to rob banks um, in this sort of neighborhood from these sorts of people, um, and they're, they're seeing it as this sort of value. Um, so, he's just, so he's basically saying these are things people learn, and if we want to intervene, then we actually have to engage with that learning process, um, rather than being super concerned with why they're doing it. Um, because it's usually pretty obvious why they're doing it. They're doing it because it's, it could be fun, it could be high paying, or, or you know, the, the, they imagine that they're going to get a lot of money, it could be thrilling, and so on and so forth. Um, again, we'll see throughout the, this half of the term um, all of the different reasons people engage in things ranging, ranging from um, theft to murder. Um, they're, they're, many of the reasons um, are quite similar to why people do things like have jobs um, and play the lottery. 
Um, so much like Hershey, again, so the, I bring him up afterwards. Again, it was a little bit of a debate whether I finish off term one with uh, Mr. Sutherland or with Mr. Hershey, um, because he's writing er earlier. Um, but as I said, it makes sense now because everything uh, kind of is in response to this. Um, but when he was writing, he had many of the same frustrations um, of, as Hershey did. Uh, so basically, remember we said um, Hershey introduced that concept of substantive positivism. Um, and I, I know you know what that is because that was on, on the nice little fun midterm and some of you answered that question. Um, but so, uh, can anyone remind us what substantive positivism is? Just in light of this, so you can see what he's frustrated with. So when I'm drawing the connection to substantive positivism, so what is substantive positivism? Just break up the word, or the term, into two words. Yep. It's like positivism, but also it's that like bonds and people's experiences. More general than that, that's like very specific. What is it? What it if, if I'm saying you're a substantive positivist, what are, what are you doing? I could say that to you about anything, any kind of research. Yeah. What are the specific conditions that result in a specific crime? Right, you're, you're trying to isolate specific causes for things. So here, um, uh, what's it called, uh, Sutherland, much like Hershey, he doesn't use that term, but he says criminology and the sociology of deviance, although it wasn't called that back then, they're dominated by what he called a multi-factorial, multi-causal approach. Um, that we have all of these little independent variables like social class, neighborhood, sex, race, income, um, all of these things, al alcoholic parents, and adequate socialization. We have all of these substantive factors, again, substantive just meaning um, of substance of an area. Again, as I mentioned in sociology, our substantive areas are things like gender, race, um, sociological theory, culture. Um, so substantive positivism is, is simply um, looking for positive principles um, associated with those, substance, with those substantive things. Um, so here, quote, criminal behaviors determined by a variety of concrete conditions, such as mental conditions, broken homes, and so on and so forth. Um, now, Sutherland wasn't quite as mad at Hershey as this, uh, or as Hershey at this a state of affairs. Um, he thought, you know, again, people here were responding to Lombroso um, and all of these awful criminologists before who were reducing people to skull sizes and all of this. Um, and so introducing all of these social factors, like broken homes and stuff, was seen as a step in the right direction uh, to Sutherland. So again, he's saying, okay, we're now seeing, you know, sociological factors at play, but it seems as though we've opened the floodgates. And so now it's not my skull size that's you know, causing me to do crime, but it's all of these other things. Um, and, and so it just seems this list could go on forever. And then, like Hershey said, what do we really know about crime and deviance? If just we have hundreds and hundreds of variables that may be correlated with it. Um, we still aren't getting at, again, he's not interested in how, but in why, but we're not getting at how people actually do this. We're moving further and further and away from crime and deviance, actually, and just onto all these variables. Um, so overall, he's just saying the state of affairs is kind of chaotic, and we need a theory again. Um, so in the article I had you read by Matt Sueda, which kind of um, you know summarizes uh, summarizes Sutherland's position pretty well. Again, I had you read the the direct source uh, of Sutherland, just a few pages of it, just so you could see. Um, but Matt Sueda says, again, here, looking at criminology kind of as in a chaotic state, he's trying to unify all of these different kind of causal factors into a general mechanism. Um, and again, we'll see the theory that he comes up with, which the, the name of it is actually quite, um, it, it's quite indicative of what it is, is differential association. Which again, when you just think of it, probably doesn't really mean anything. Uh, you, you know, people differently associated or whatever. Um, but as we'll see, the theory of differential association. Um, oops, <laughs> I was I, I wrote what I said, not what I meant. Um, differential association is really 
the process of people choosing to be different, choosing to be deviant. And so we'll get at what that looks like. Um, so Sutherland essentially argues that people learn to commit crime and to engage in acts of deviance. So getting a face tattoo, screaming in the classroom, killing someone, whatever, anything that would be criminal and or deviant against norms. They learn to do that through communication. And importantly, not just any communication, you know, because I could tell you, you know, like, go out and kill people or whatever. I wouldn't say that. Oh, I did just say it, I guess, but I don't, I don't mean it. Um, I, keep, I keep writing things wrong. What's wrong with me? Um, communication and... Communication, but communication that is seen as intimate. So again, anyone can tell you, I can tell you a whole bunch of things. Maybe, you know, and, and, and the university would be mad at me if I told you things, because they would say, how dare you do that, Lawrence? You're in a position of authority, and you're a role model, and you're telling people, and they're going to you know, emulate you, and, and then that's bad. Um, but if some random person on the street told you to do something, it may not resonate very much with you. Um, so Hershey, sorry, uh, Sutherland says, you'll see it's actually quite similar in this regard uh, to Hershey with social bonds. He says... When you look at people engaged in crime and deviance, they usually have long histories or tenures of communicating with people whom they care about, so people close to them, teachers, peers, uh, parents, even their children, although that would be rare, you know, and adults learning to commit crime from their kids. We could all teach our parents how to like hack people's accounts and send uh, scam emails and stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend doing that. Um, but um, he says, when you talk to people that are, that are you know, criminal or deviant, they've learned this from people that they care about or that they talk to a lot. Um, and that at the root of this, so you're, you're, you're talking to people you care about this, at the root of this is some bigger understanding of the validity of the law. So this is where it differs with Hershey. Remember Hershey said, oh, you know, people will engage in crime or deviance. And this is really the key, key point. So Hershey says, remember his big thing of, of ultimately in his general theory, it ended with self-control. Saying that, you know, we all want to like deviate sometimes, but the reason we don't is because we don't want to mess up our bonds with the people we care about. We don't want to taint ourselves to normal society. So like, and, and you know, I may want to just say, you know, forget teaching. I want to sit down and play Diablo 2, my old, my old RPG, which I actually just downloaded again. Um, so I just want to play that and make a new character and like download a hack. But I'm, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to taint myself and like lose my job and have everyone think I'm nuts or something. So that's Hershey. Now, Sutherland instead would say, Maybe if I decided to go out and do that deviant thing, it's because I've actually come to the conclusion that I don't care about my teaching career or I don't care about what other people think of me. Um, so it's not just self-control. It may be that my underlying attitude towards the normal quote-unquote society has somehow shifted. So this may seem like a bit of a stretch, but you'll see in the article, Sutherland talks about attitudes towards laws and legal violations. Um, but what these really represent, again, are your underlying attitudes towards normal society. Remember, we talked a lot about that in the first half of the course, how people that commit crime and deviance, um, they're often uh, you know, just disengaging from things that are seen as normal or pro-social. So things like school and the workplace. Um, for, for differential association, the reason why I'm saying your kind of attitude towards the law, your attitudes towards quote-unquote normal life, why that's key, is for Sutherland, people, in order for them to engage in crime and deviance, they have to have literally differentially associated. 
which means they now no longer associate with quote unquote normal society or with the law, but with counter laws, with counter norms. So this, you can think of this very clearly. What does this sound like I'm saying? Imagine uh, a, a punk or a kid who is like, screw school, screw my parents. Um, and they're hanging around other people like that. What does that sound like culturally? What, how would you call that group, right? A yeah, a counter, so, so he comes up with, you know, th this theory is really a theory of countercultures in some senses, but even more subcultures. So the process that we'll see again, for Hershey, he assumed either you were with us or you were kind of like out of it and just by yourself. Remember, ultimately it was self-control. So it wasn't really even with us or against us. It was just kind of, you've bought into society, you're going to plan long-term, you're gonna be a good person, or you're kind of a basket case who's like giving into your hedonic impulses and having no self-control. For differential association, it's either you're with us, or really, you, you're against us, or you're part of something else. Um, so this is the first theory of subcultures, of saying, you know, um, maybe I've transitioned from being, you know, a professor right now who's trying to graduate, thinking, okay, like, um, I'm, I'm putting everything in terms of my career identity as this, and this is where I'm going, and one day, through frequently associating with my gamer friends, I kind of say, you know what, actually I had it right 12 years ago, I shouldn't have gone back to school, and I'm gonna go deep into this world, um, and I'm gonna like say, you know, F you to, to higher education or whatever. Yep. I was just gonna ask, um, so under this theory, someone who chooses tag TV, uh, is it a, more so a view of norms and such in an apathetic manner where they just don't care, or is it the kind of thing where they're rejecting it like wholeheartedly, they're actively against it? For this, that's a great question. Um, so it can be either, but for in most cases, it's an active rejection. Um, so this is, the, again, the key difference, and it's a great question. So again, think of the term for differential association. There's a lot of agency involved in this process as opposed to some of the other theories. You're, you're deciding to differentially associate, which again means, okay, people are associated in their little institutions, they're going to the school, they're going to work, they're having their families, I'm gonna be different. Um, so, so this is really a theory of, of subcultures and countercultures. So when, you're, when we talk about other things going forward, like gang members, um, uh, sex workers, whatever the case is, this is giving a view of these individuals as actively choosing what they're doing. Um, and we'll see that idea of active choice becomes a little bit complicated when you go back to people's ch childhood. Um, so you know, if you, if you say someone who's, who now is like, screw society, and you go back in their life, um, and, and look at their childhood and say, well, actually, they were just around a whole bunch of people that taught them, um, you know, to say, screw society. Um, how much of it is it really their choice, right? So if their parents were telling them for their whole life, like, you should drop out of school, or you should be a sex worker, or you should be a drug dealer, um, or you should be in the mafia, um, then how much of that choice is, is that really theirs? Um, that's a bit of a separate issue, though. For this theory, it's really, when you look at crime and deviance, again, we're not super interested in the why. The why is, well, people will do crime and deviance for a whole bunch of things, for a whole bunch of reasons. The same reason why they'll do anything else. We don't know. We can't always know people's motives. But we can study how, and we can see that they enter into this by getting to the point where they see normal society as not really for them. Well, see, this is the central point of this second half of the term, debating this fundamental thesis of differential association. The idea that people can kind of flip against normal society is radically criticized by many people. But this is, this is kind of our, our center. Um, so we'll see the Sutherlands of the world see that you can differentially associate the Matskas, the Matzas and, the, and, and, the, and the Sykes um, with techniques of neutralization the Jack Katzes that we'll see later, the Levi's, pretty much everyone else says, I don't really think people are that flighty because the world would be really scary if it was. Um, but this is kind of our new, our new baseline. Um, okay, so 
And don't worry, we'll be, I'll be spending more time mapping out this, this process and our study buddy questions will be about that. Um, so definitions of law violation. As I said, law violation is, he, he's, he's a criminologist and he's focused exclusively on the law, but you can also think of it as um, kind of normal definitions um, or just being you know, a quote unquote normative law abiding person. Um, so he says people will engage in, cr and again, sorry, I need to make that connection, otherwise deviance won't make sense. Remember, deviance is not illegal um, necessarily. Deviance could just be acting bizarre in a situation, acting against social norms. Um, so here, whenever he's writing about crime, think this also applies to deviance if you make it not about laws and about norms. Um, so here, someone will um, commit crime due to reaching this point where definitions that are favorable to the law, so things like the law should always be, held, should always be upheld because it's based on, on having an equitable justice system, the world would be chaos without things like the police, um, you know, we should trust the government, whatever thing you've heard from people that you love and trust or the media, um, once you've heard more definitions against the law, so screw the cops, side sucks, um, everyone's trying to oppress me or whatever, um, life's better somewhere else, um, I wish I was in a communist country instead of capitalist, whatever thing you can think of that's countercultural or against society. Um, once you reach that point where that's kind of your automatic thought um, when you're entering a room or whatever, um, that is once when you've differentially associated to Sutherland. So again, this sounds kind of magical and random, but it's not. Again, think of when you change attitudes or perspectives. We, you know, the whole point of higher education is to have you undergo multiple changes of perspectives. Uh, you know, we assume that high school students, in when they're coming into sociology, that they have thoughts of things when they're coming into first year, um, and we want to challenge those things. You know, the whole idea of university is being about fostering critical thinking, is having you frame and reframe things over and over again. Um, so he says this happens, again, through intimate communication. And it doesn't mean like sex or anything like that. Again, it's communication with people you care about. Um, so the more intense, the more valued, the more frequent, and the more often that you engage in communication with people that you care about, saying, I don't want to do normal things, I want to do illegal things, I don't trust the state, I don't value the law, I don't value like traditional career paths, I don't value tradition, I don't value religion. Um, the more you have those sorts of conversations, so I'll just walk you through those points, um, the more likely you are to reach that point. <laughs> um, so again, intensity. It's a fun one to think through. Again, um, me as the professor of this class, again, as I said, maybe more or less intimate with you based on whether you already knew me, based on how much you liked the course. Um, that, so that could establish that bond for some of you. Um, so now let's say you view me as one of your intimates. Um, I could now, you know, casually tell you, um, go and play Diablo 2. Or I could get like really, really extra about it um, and start putting all my slides, have like little subliminal messages of Diablo, start playing Diablo while I'm doing this, give you bonus marks for playing Diablo, and just really be intense about it, right? Um, priority. That's related to the intimacy. Um, so if I'm just neutral to you, like, yeah, he's okay, whatever, um, that might be different. My Diablo indoctrination might be different than if you're like, I'm all into Lawrence's Kool-Aid and I want to be like him. Um, so if, if you prioritize me and you want to be like me and you see me as a role model, then my indoctrination is more likely to work. Frequency. So if all of my slides are doing that, and I'm doing that all of the time, so you can't think of anything else, and I have it in your tests, and I have it on the walls, and I start wearing clothes like that. So it's just everywhere. Frequency. It's every thought you have, more likely. 
And then lastly, duration. Um, if, I, if I start sending you emails after the course is done um, and I like show up at your workplace uh, with, with, Di with like Diablo 2 swag um, and I like hack your email or whatever, um, then you're, you'll be more likely to do it. Um, you'll also be more likely to call the police and snap and do all these other things. Um, but you get, I'm, being, I'm using a funny example, but um, the idea here is let's say playing Diablo 2 was, de I, I said it was deviant, um, you're more likely to engage in the deviant act of playing Diablo 2 if you value what I say, if I say it really intensely, um, if I say it all the time, and you're kind of constantly saturated with this idea. Um, so that helps explain, and I use the word indoctrination on purpose, because it very much almost can be read as a form of brainwashing. So when you think of children that join gangs early in life, um, you know, before they really have much of a say in what they do, it's very often because uh, of things like peer pressure, family pressure, being introduced to these ideas very early, um, hearing how cool they are, seeing valued members of their social worlds doing it, seeing it all the time. Um, you know, that's one of the arguments against violent video games and violent media, that if you see those things all of the time, um, and you're living in an environment where people are actually engaging in violence, and you may know some people that are doing that, all of these things kind of whirling together could make you more likely to differentially associate. Um, so again, hopefully I'm painting a picture of this theory, which, which really shows this as something you're learning. So again, just, you know, in all of my classes, I always try to get people to, to think how reframing things and theorizing can be fun. And I'm trying to give you, I'm trying to make people differentially associate to the way I view the world. So I use these tactics. That's why I use the word brainwashing, because I do that in my own little way. Um, but I, I try not to be so extra about it, because uh, I, I, that's the one thing I don't agree with the theory. I think if you make things too obvious, then people will know and they'll resist. Um, so it's subtle indoctrination. Um, we'll read about that, actually, with the bread salesman with the term gradual corruption, that sometimes less is more when you want to indoctrinate people. Um, but anyway, so, uh, quote, therefore, definitions presented more frequently for a longer time of exposure earlier in life and from either a more prestigious source or a more intense relationship receive more weight in the DA differential association process. So again, whether if I tell you something, it's very different from if your best friend tells you, very different from some guy on the street. Presumably, unless you totally view everyone the same. Um, okay, so I left the cards in the office, um, so you can just talk about this, um, and I will pass out um, an attendance sheet uh, for today. Um, so, uh, and you can, you can write it down if you'd like, um, if, if it's helpful for you, but you could take personal notes maybe. Um, so provide an example where non-mainstream norms and values impacted a person or group's involvement in crime or deviance. If it wasn't these norms or values, then what was it? Um, discuss and explain. So what I mean by that, you can get rid of the second one. So provide an example where non-mainstream norms and values impacted a person's group, a person or group's involvement in crime and deviance. Um, if you think they involved in themselves in this for some other reason, you can, you can talk about that. But basically, um, we're, I want you to get into the idea of people differentially associating. So you can focus on the first part. Okay, so get in your little groups. Differentially associate, all of you. <laughs> All right, so does anyone want to share their examples of, um, of norms impacting people's decisions to deviate? Go. Um, it's, uh, have you heard of um, the XCM, I think it's pronounced? XCM? Yeah. yeah. So it's like a cult group, um, but uh, yeah, the, the guru of the uh, cult his name is um, Kenneth Vermeer. Basically, um, I don't know like a lot about this um, cult, but um, they were a subculture, I think, but they turned into a um, counterculture in a way because the guru was like really spreading like 
um, how difficult it is to live in a contemporary society and like to get a job or like you know do just normal things regularly. And if you want to like succeed in your life and like um, better yourself spiritually, you can take these like courses that you know that are really expensive, and then like you can actually be become a part of this community. And once you become a part of this community, you're gonna get better and better, and then stuff like that basically, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that that would fall under the um, four. Um, principles of like intensity, priority, mm -hmm. frequency, and duration, because the priority definitely, whatever the guru says, um, it's really prioritized or like it becomes really important. So people listen and it's really in intense because there's like a lot of workshops and it's really expensive is what I heard. Mm -hmm. Like literally like $10,000 for like a one month um, course of something and frequency um, members, like the group members, they keep encouraging like the newcomers to just keep it going, you know, oh, you're gonna do great if you keep it going, and it's frequently um, um, encouraged, and then the duration is longer and longer, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And cult entry in general, um, uh, continuing my theme of being, uh, you know, TMI and unprofessional. My mom actually, uh, well, I call it a cult, um, but she joined she joined a religion or a religious movement uh, roughly 20 years ago. Um, what? <laughs> The way I said it was funny. Um, but no, St. Germain Foundation, or the, the Almighty I Am, whatever, it has a weird name. Um, it's like a spin-off of Catholicism, which is what we were. We were my, both my parents were Roman Catholic growing up. Um, Non-practicing, though. They're, my parents were the black sheep of the family and whatever. Uh, anyway, so she went on her hunt. She took philosophy at U of T. So again, you know, if you take certain kinds of courses, you prime yourself for like rethinking things. Uh, not blaming what she took, but anyway. Um, so she, she joined this thing about 20 years ago called the St. Germain Foundation. Um, and they, and you know, they, instead of having saints, they had what were called ascended masters. Um, and they did daily chants about you know, self-purifying and everything. Um, long story short, um, on my, just after my 18th birthday, my mom told me that, you know, and I, I had already known, part of the religion was cutting off all your worldly ties. Um, before you ascend to their version of heaven. So your violet flame could leave your body. Um, so she told me that. Um, well, yeah, I knew that for a, a long time. And I, when I was a little kid, I was, I was going to the little cult near um, Mount Pleasant. And it was, it was uh, near Eglinton and Mount Pleasant on like the second floor. Um, and uh, I had this like plastic sword and I would cut the violet flame around me and like ascend and, and like, yeah, anyway. And I, I liked it because I would have pizza at McDonald's afterwards because they, they had pizza at McDonald's back then. Yeah, I love that. Um, anyway, now that frickin' McDonald's that I went to is shut down for the LRT, the new light rail or whatever on Eglinton. But anyway, um, so, um, yeah, so, so I, would, I would go to that cult and I knew it, and I knew that part of it, the way I interpreted that was like, okay, before you die or like in your end of life, uh, I study death and dying too because of this largely, but um, the part of it, part of it was, you know, just like, you know, make peace with the world, whatever. Um, my mom interpreted that very literally. So the last couple, kind of couple of years that before my 18th birthday, she started cutting off all her family members. So like she left her parents, she like all her friends, she wrote them like these nasty letters and like just basically cut everyone off. Um, and then uh, after my 18th birthday, she, she said she was gonna leave my dad. They were already like divorced, they were separated. Um, but then she fully left, um, and then I haven't seen her in 14 years. Um, and we've hired people to find her, but she's gone under the radar. So anyway, that's my, uh, not stigmatizing cults, but that's my one little, I, my little true story of that. Um, so again, I don't want the St. Germain Foundation coming after me. Um, but uh, I don't blame them. I don't know. I think she, I, I read the books. I still have them. I mean, I went through them and nowhere does it say to do what she did. But um, yeah, she, anyway. So symbolic interactionism, as we'll see, 
things, you interpret things differently. And she neutralized her deviance. She differentially associated, but by herself. I don't know. She said she may, like, I know she has to be working under the table um, somewhere, like, like cashless, because there's no, uh, she's left no paper trail. Um, but anyway, my, my big, now, you know, I slowly unpack through TMI things, um, my, why I'm teaching and doing things, but my interest in deviance and all these weird things comes very much from my mother and my father, too, who hired a private eye on her t too many times, even from before, so she had a penchant for running away for, anyway. Um, okay, so on that, on that lovely weird note, um, we can take our 10 minute break, and then uh, when we come back, we will move into techniques of neutralization, which are my favorite theory, because I love to neutralize my deviance all the time. So. <laughs> So uh, I just want to make sure everyone can see it. It should be there for you too. Um, I think the exams have been released. Yeah. So we are Tuesday, August 13th. 9 a.m. Yeah, I know. They always do that. But they were nice, so... Um, That's not nice. Why did you do this to us? No, I mean, they were nice in the sense that it's not all the way like August 20th or 23rd or whatever, because the window was so wide. Um, yeah, so I requested, I requested earlier uh, in August. Um, they don't listen to our requests normally, but um, I should be, hopefully, um, defending my dissertation in the end of August. So um, I just, uh, I, I wanted a week, so whatever, prepare for that, because they give you extra comments the week before. So I'm defending on the 22nd if they still let me. Um, so I just said anything before the 18th, if you can. So that's good, because um, our last class is well before that. So we end in July. So. Uh, it's still a ways away. You'll have like two full weeks to study. Um, and I'll have office hours and all of that ahead of time. Um, but yeah, so I wish it was a bit later in the day, but um, it's good to get it over with. Then you'll be done. YOLO, all that, stu all that nice stuff, right? So, and we have class at 10 anyway, so you're already, you're already used to it. Um, you won't need the full three hours. I'll talk about the exam later, but um, I'm just, I gave the three hour window because it's worth a lot, but um, it won't be that much longer than, than the test you just wrote. Um, was it 9 to 12? Yeah, 9 to 12. Okay, um, so we'll go through this, and then I'll talk a bit about the essay, although, again, luckily, in this class we have tutorials, um, so Jason will be talking more about that tomorrow. Um, so, Sykes and Matza, so kind of really, you know, the way I entered into deviance um, myself. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm very interested um, in part because of my mother and also just other people I know. I know, I know a lot of strange people who um, do a lot of strange things, myself included. Um, so I've always been interested in kind of how people justify and neutralize these weird little quirky things that we do. Um, again, some more serious, like my mom leaving, um, you know, I think, did she differentially associate or or is she like can't, like just against society? Like has she always been this way? Um, so these theories to me have personal resonance. Um, so I'm trying to make them personally uh, meaningful for you too, using a variety of examples. Um, but techniques of neutralization is probably my favorite, um, just because I think it captures. Um, it's a very simple theory, but it captures how complicated people really are. Um, you know, I, I'm not of the opinion that most people just flip of the switch like go against society. Um, I think the process happens more slowly. Um, and this theory uh, enables understanding of that a little bit better. Um, and even more importantly, it covers how this kind of transformation doesn't have to be permanent. Um, so people may become part of a subculture for a while, but then they may bounce back. So that idea actually, as we'll see, is the central criticism that these authors level, level at Sutherland. Basically the idea that, different, that when people engage in crime and deviance, they may not be quite so certain about why they're doing it. Um, and this maybe makes us theorize it differently. 
Um, so before we get into that, we'll see he summarizes differential, or they, they summarize differential association theory before they come up with their own. So this is kind of what they're speaking against, um, just like how positivism was speaking against the classical school. Um, so quote, differential association theory asserts that criminal or delinquent behavior involves the learning of techniques of committing crimes and motives, drives, rationalizations, and attitudes favorable to the violation of law. And again, extending it to deviance, um, to anti-normative kind of deviant things. Um, and the idea of a delinquent subculture is usually what's talked about. So people learn it from peers, from family members, from friends, from neighbors that have somehow differentially associated. Again, people that have reached that point where the law or the norms aren't for me. Now, Sykes and Matza critique this, saying, does the idea of a subculture really make sense when you think about exactly the kind of implications that it has? Now, a subculture, by definition, has inverted or reversed norms from widespread society. So a delinquent youth subculture, for example, um, would be the cool kids or the stoners. Um, so let's say they, or whatever you call them now, I guess they would be the YouTubers or the Instagrammers. No, no, that, they wouldn't be. I don't know what they would be. The Twitchers, the people, um, yeah, it was tweakers in the past on drugs, now it's Twitchers going online and like live streaming while they're in class or something, I don't know. But, but um, the subculture is saying, here are your norms, I'm gonna do the opposite. So I'm rebelling. It's that, Mer it's that Mertonian rebellion, right? Like you, you see the norm, you disagree with it, you reject it, and then you create a new one. Um, now that sounds intuitive. When you think of little Bobby, the twitcher in the class who's, who's twitching on, on you know, Diablo 4 or whatever instead of doing his math class, um, and you see a bunch of Billies and Bobbies and whoever doing this, um, and, and they seem opposed to mainstream values, and you say, oh, this is a delinquent subculture. That, that makes sense intuitively, but, but if they really were part of this inverted world, this, this de uh, deviant subculture, you wouldn't see these four things. So, you're just using the fake examples of Billy and Bobby, the, the Diablo 4 twitchers. Um, when caught, they should feel like martyrs. So if, they're, if they truly are Diablo 4 twitching subculture kings, or whatever they, they want to go by, if they truly are that, then when they're caught, they should feel like a martyr. They should feel like a saint. Instead, when people like them are caught, they often, in interview settings, sense, be sensed to have a sense of shame. Um, people often, when they're caught doing things, feel legitimately poorly. Even people that seem they were parts of subcultures. Um, they may front or whatever in the beginning and say, yeah, you know, this is okay. Um, but more often than not, they regret their decisions. Um, part of the age crime curve that I discussed in the first half of the of the term, um, how, how crime tends to lower as people get older. Um, remember, self-control theory talked about that. Um, part of that is people come through, you know, through some sense of wisdom, maturity, having more normal associations as they get older, they come to regret their deviant decisions. Um, so often when people are imprisoned or caught or, you know, publicly ridiculed, um, they, they will announce regret. They may not fully regret it, um, but they, they certainly don't necessarily they certainly don't always feel like martyrs and saints and proud of what they did. Um, second, this is linked to the fact that um, pe people that have engaged in crime and deviance very rarely have they completely turned on every quote-unquote normal person. They often still have anchors in their communities. Um, so think of even stereotypes of really hardened criminals. What's the one thing you would never say to like an extremely violent dude, stereotypically? You would never insult his mother, right? So if he was totally countercultural, and I know I'm part of this freaking YOLO club, whatever, and I hate everyone, because um, I only live once, 
once and I'm gonna kill you twice. <laughs> if, I, if I was that, um, that's my YOLO gang, right? And so, yeah, if I'm in the YOLO gang, but you talk about my mom and she's not part of the YOLO gang, she's like a freaking whatever, she's whoever, wherever, and I get upset, that's, you know, saying, oh, well, I'm still buying into normal definitions of like family. Um, also, uh, for many gangs, for most gangs in the US, uh, Bloods and Crips and so on, um, the church is a sacred space. You can't, you can't, like, you can run to the church. If you watch The Wire, you'd see that with, with, uh, with um, Chicago gangs and, and other, uh, sorry, with, with American gangs. Um, if you watch many TV shows with gangs, people will run into churches because there's, there, those are no violent zones. So again, if you're part of the YOLO gang, why is it that then a church or talking about your mama would be so devastating? Um, clearly, you still have some ties with normal society. Um, linked to that uh, are taboos against injuring one's friends. Um, so we'll see this with the bread salesman later on um, and, the, and, and what happens when people steal from one another. Um, ideas of brotherhood among gang members, for example, and increasingly sisterhood as things are becoming more diverse. Um, but brotherhood, sisterhood, families, um, quotes such as don't steal from friends, those again make you think, hmm, the subculture is still buying into something more normal. Um, and then lastly, uh, most delinquents or people involved in deviance and crime and criminals, um, they still live, and this is really important, again, just for thinking of things in a practical sense, um, the bulk of their lives are still quite normal. So I can speak to this personally when I differentially associated when I was like 16 or 17 um, and then realized I didn't actually differentially associate because obviously I'm now a professor. Um, but when I was, you know, when I, when I dropped out of school and I was playing games all the time, um, I still was working. I still was trying to present as like a normal community member. So I didn't like advertise the fact that I was truant from school. I didn't like tell people, you know, yeah, I dropped out. I'm proud of this. Um, I hid that from people. I was hiding that and kind of living my secret, um, you know, gamer life. Um, so most studies of, again, quote unquote, delinquents and criminals and deviants, um, they're very often concealing what they're doing. Uh, we we in the media will see the ones um, that are like really proud of it, um, but most when they're living their lives, many you know they can be parents, they're still children, they're community members, they go to church, they have friends, um, they're normal people um, that do deviant things. So Sykes and Matza say, you know, it's tempting to look at this idea of people flipping the switch through these intense conversations, becoming indoctrinated or choosing to differentially associate for whatever reason. But that's not really what most people do. Most people engage, when they're engaging in crime and deviance, they are still part of normal society. They're just doing certain criminal and deviant things. So again, someone imagine, and this speaks to Zachary's question earlier, of why differential association theory doesn't explain certain sort of kinds of crime and deviance. Think of someone, I always use this example because it's perfect for this. Imagine if you wanted to study fare evasion in Toronto and you looked at people that didn't pay their fare on the TTC and you tried to study that through differential association theory. What would you be assuming right off the bat if you were using that theory to, to study that? Would that seem right to you? What would you be assuming? Yep. Probably that they learned that fair evasion is okay by someone important to them. Yeah, but more than that, remember the, the thing about law violation. Why might it seem a bit strange? How might someone criticize differential association theory for something like fair evasion? Think of the person evading the fare. Yep. It's kind of weird to picture someone who, I reject the idea of paying fare to go on the bus. Well, and think just even more practically, why, why might this not work for a person? For, you're right, but think of, like, how would the person be behaving in that situation? I, I think it's just like, you notice all this uh, easy opportunity to get on for free, I don't have to pay and just like sneak on. Well, like, you don't have to have like, other people to like, kind of be a part of a subculture that does it. Or, like, you can just 
mm -hmm. opportunity and take advantage. Exactly. So which of these would apply to this? I mean, there's something here that, would, that really makes you think differential association doesn't apply very well. Which of these numbers? Think. You're, an, you're evading the fair. Just think of most people that would do that. We've all done things like that. Or maybe we haven't. Maybe I'm the only deviant. Yep. Maybe number one, because yes. the coffee feels shameful about it. Yes. So when I was a little kid, I loved slushies. I still love slushies. I used to go on long walks and I'd get slushies from Becker's or Max, whatever they call it now. Or they still have both. Um, so I'd get big slushies. And they always police little kids at these things. So I would fill it and they're always thinking we're going like to eat it while we're, while we're making it. Um, so I, I often would do that. So I would make it, I'd make a big slushy, and then I would like pretend to spill it. And then, so I could lick the side. It was really bizarre but I would do that. But, um, and then one guy actually realized that I was doing that over time. And I was so mortified. I was like, oh my God. Because like, I just wanted, you know, I wanted to, to see how my mix were. So I'd try a little bit and then I'd stir it up and then spill it again and then put more in. I just really cared about the ratio of the flavors because I'd usually put like three or four. Um, and, but then when I found that, I was like, oh my God. And then he, but he was treating me as though I was like a deviant. Like, I know you've been doing this and da da da. And I, I, I wasn't. I mean, I was, but I wasn't because I, I, in my mind, I wasn't. Like, I wasn't some hardened, slushy criminal. I was just, I wanted a right mix and I didn't, I, I didn't have money to buy another one. Um, so anyway, I was no, I was no. No martyr there. Um, and I think most people, if you caught them fair evading, again, think of someone, you know, you might see some, you know, hard type get on and like, I don't care or whatever, or someone, you know, suffering from something. Um, you see that downtown, right? Like the homeless people and stuff, they're going through a lot. Maybe for them, they, they wouldn't feel ashamed um, or if they're disoriented or something. Um, but if you see like a business, someone, a stereotypically well-dressed person, and then you catch them doing that. Um, and again, this, this is a funny example. Um, graduate students would often fare evade. I have seen them do it on the UTM shuttle buses um, because you can show your student card and people are the, the workers supposed to scan it, but oftentimes they don't. And so we all have T cards, but we get like reimbursed for, for shuttle bus tickets. So I know that people have been embezzling from the University of Toronto by getting reimbursed for shuttle bus tickets that they're not using. And if you caught them, some nice little do-gooder grad student who's like, oh, I'm just grading my papers. If you caught them, they, they would probably freak out and they'd be like, well, what am I supposed to do? I, I'm just, I, uh, my working conditions or your learning conditions, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, to grade here and then, you know, they would do that. They wouldn't be like, screw you, yes, I'm doing this. So anyway, maybe one would, one out of a hundred, but, but most, I think, would probably be like that. Um, and they could justify it, as we'll see, with things like my working conditions or your learning conditions and, oh, whatever, I'm part of this union and I don't have the money and, you know, every, we're all struggling students, we're all in it together, da 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 da. Um, so, so, right? So, so, um, uh, so here, basically, they're saying, People can learn loopholes to deviate. Not everyone that's deviating is some radical deviant that's like, oh, I'm, I'm differentially associated, this, I'm screw this legal order. We kind of have learned that deviance can be relatively acceptable sometimes. Um, and we know this culturally. So we learn things, again, we're smart, we're adapting to our environment. So we know that things aren't always black and white. So we hear stories of people getting away with murders. Um, things like the O.J. Simpson trial going on forever. Things like, um, you know, Hillary Clinton with Bill Clinton justifying his sexual escapades. We hear these things in the media, um, neutralizing people's deviance all the time. Um, and, and we've done little things in our lives about, you know, think of the, the biggest example is when you're a little kid and, and the kid with the hand in the cookie jar. Oh, mom, I was hungry. You know, it's like, well, then why didn't you have the freaking apple over there? And, and it's like, well, I didn't know. I don't know how to wash apples. So I had to, I had to have the whatever, right? Um, so we do that all the time. So examples here are, you know, uh, about big ones of uh, thinking of, of murder. Um, we know that, that killing someone is not always murder because you can kill someone in a war. Um, that's, you could imagine someone extending that further um, when they're part of a gang and having turf wars and then saying, well, I'm not some cold-blooded killer. I'm killing someone that's, that's your, I'm, I'm taking care of business. I'm getting rid of people that are encroaching our territory. Um, that's why gangs talk 
in warlike terms, and they don't always feel like they're cold-blooded murderers or killers. Um, sometimes they do, and you'll see that in songs, but very often it's, it's, uh, they're, they're neutralizing that deviance using war motifs. Um, stealing in times of need. Again, so the graduate student who, if you push them on that, they would say very likely, well, I'm a struggling student, I'm like you, I need this money, I know it's bad, but I'm doing it because da-da-da. Um, they very rarely would then say, yeah, that's what I'm doing, I'm against this, screw you, because they're not going to lose all their TA ships and their graduate school over $6 on the bus. Um, they're, they're probably still committed to that. Um, so as you see, this is this this. I like this theory because it's more fun, and you can use fun examples like the ones I'm using. Um, but that's you know, you can't you can't be a sociologist just by picking things you find you find more fun. Um, legitimately, this theory I think captures um, the decision making process uh, more more accurately for most people. Um, again, it's very rare to find someone who is 100% against society. Um, even my mother, with the with you know when when she, we would press her about the the religion she was a part of, um, she would neutralize that completely. Um, she would say, "Oh, you know, like it, it has a more welcoming community. Yeah, the chants can seem strange, but how is that any different from saying the rosary? Um, all all of these things she would neutralize at every corner. She never said, "Yes, I'm part of this weird cult, and you're stupid, and duh. like like that's just not how how she would do things. Um, even though she, you know, from the outside perspective perspective could seem differentially associated as someone who graduated from the University of Toronto in the 70s and works under the table jobs at coffee shops to avoid having a paper trail and doesn't use computers because she doesn't want to be surveilled. Um, and, and all of these things that she's done, um, in her mind, she's still a normal person. Um, she is not some radical deviant. Um, so techniques of neutralization, the key here, and this, um, to go to the question about self-narratives and, and, and the, the internal process, um, part of why I like this theory too is my research is, is on how people make choices and decisions. Um, and, and this theory really explains that process well. Um, so essentially, what it allows you to do is you learn techniques that minimize the feeling of shame or guilt. So a technique of neutralization is something you learn, so it's a technique, it's a skill. So someone highly skilled in, in techniques of neutralization would be able to justify his or her deviance in any situation. Um, that would obviously mean, you know, knowing where and when you can pick your battles. Um, there's, there's some things that would be harder to do, um, but others more easy. Um, so I'll give you some examples. So the five techniques. So people often, you know, these have been debated and there's new ones being added and removed and so on and so forth. But there are kind of five broad categories of techniques. Um, and these, again, have been, sh they're, they're proven to not only be effective, but to actually commonly be used. Um, so again, Sykes and Matza say, these are things we see people do all the time. Um, so denying responsibility, denying injury, denying the victim, condemning the condemners, and appealing to higher loyalties. So again, think of a person being caught red-handed, hand in the cookie jar, and you think, have they turned on quote-unquote normality or the law, or are they using techniques of neutralization? So denial of responsibility. This is the most commonly used. So this is someone who says, well, what do you mean I did this? I didn't do this. Um, the, you know, you, you may, you, it looks like I did this. It looks like I was stealing the cookie, but I was actually just counting the chocolate chips. Um, it looks like I was eating this cookie, but this one was already broken, and I'm actually eating like a fig or something that's in my mouth. Oh, show me what's in your mouth. No, that's rude. I don't do that. Um, and, you know, so, uh, uh, or let's say, okay, fine, I'm eating it. Fine, you caught me. But what was I supposed to do? I just read today about low blood sugar 
sugar issues. And I thought, you know, I like I have a test next month. And if I don't, you know, if I don't eat this cookie now, maybe my whole month of studying will be a little bit worse. And then I will fail the test because I'm a marginal student. And, you know, so what am I supposed to do? Or, you know, yeah, you know, actually, have you heard of this theory, differential association theory? Um, I have a lot of friends that are bad and they taught me to do this. So I, I don't really, I, I, don't, I don't know what, what you want from me. I, it's not really my responsibility. Um, so he says here, feeling, uh, I feel like a, a bi billiard ball helplessly propelled into situations. Um, so all of the justifications around here are about kind of stripping yourself of agency or decentering it um, to, to, to neutralize it. Yep. So are there two kinds then? There's like, it didn't happen, and then there's like, okay, it did happen, but it's not my fault. Yes. Okay. Well, it, it, it depends on what the person thinks they can get away with. Right. So if they're clearly seeing it, if you slap someone, yeah. then like like right, then it's like well, you, like you say no, no, I had like a I had a pulse or something, something something happened. <laughs> um, you you can try to do that. People might, um, but but they'll probably deny in some existential sense of being like, well, I was forced to do this. He was abusing me every day. So often in domestic assault. So not to make light of it, but but this comes up there of saying like, you know, is she really? So think of. Um, murder murder by self-defense. Um, is it really murder if you think your life is in danger? So that's a, you're neutralizing it. And society neutralizes that. If someone is being horribly abused or someone you're seeing a child being like victimized and tortured, um, then attacking the person doing that with sufficient force, not like going nuts on them, but doing enough to stop them, um, that is neutralized as deviance. Like it's the same act because it's, well, you know that they're doing something intolerable. Um, so yes, there's different kinds of responsibility. You could totally deny it. So an example of that is, um, you know, let's say someone saw you do something and you're, you did it. Um, you, could, you could claim insanity. Um, so that would be the partial that would say, well, I did it, but I didn't really do it. Um, or then, you know, uh, the outright denial of saying, I'm not guilty. I didn't do this. So if, if that would more be um, neutralizing it by saying, uh, if there's a cookie missing and you said, well, I don't know. You know, we have a roach problem. Like maybe they got into it. Um, and so, exactly. Okay, so denial of injury. So this one, and again, these go in stages, right? So you kind of start with the responsibility. You've been caught. Now you're responsible. So then you go to the next level. And now you say, well, was it really wrong? So yeah, I ate that stupid cookie. But A, you know, it was actually stale. So you probably would have eaten it and you would have ruined your day. And I read this other article on high blood sugar. And um, I actually realized that is better than the low blood sugar article. And it, was, it had more citations. And that one said, eating cookies in the morning, which I know you were going to do, is bad for your health. So, um, so doing that is bad. Um, so, uh, or, and then they say, well, that's, that's crap. You stole my cookie. And then they say, well, no, I didn't actually because um, I was going to buy you new ones, but I wanted to see which kind you like. So I ate this, um, and, and now I'm going to buy you one that tastes like this, but better. <laughs> um, so I didn't actually injure anything. And then denial of the victim. So this is, again, this is fun because so you're being pushed. You're being pushed further and further. So now the person says... You are trying to justify this crap. You stole my cookie, and you're, you're not buying me new ones. This is all made up. Like, go to hell. Give me my cookies. And then, and then they're saying, well, you know what? This, you deserve this. You're not a victim. Don't play victim here, because I stole one of your cookies, but you're overcharging me for rent. And, you know, people have to get things back in life. And you're lucky that I'm not, like, you know, spreading rumors about you on the internet or, or renting out my room on Airbnb. Instead, I just want this one damn cookie today. And, and leave me alone. And then condemning the condemners, extending that even further. So you know what? This is flipping the script and turning the tables. So now they go from saying, okay, I didn't really injure you because I'm putting you on a diet or I'm helping you or I'm getting better cookies or you, you're not an angel, to then saying, I actually did this because of you. What am I supposed to do? This, in this relationship, the only way I can tolerate you is by e stealing your things. And I, I need to get, you know, like you caught me. Oh, you think me stealing your cookies bad? I've actually been stealing your milk. I've been stealing your cereal. 
material. I've been going to your workplace and stealing your pens. Like, I need to get revenge on you every day. That's the only way I can get through this stupid relationship. So um, this is all your fault. And so attacks others to hide the act. So it's the escalation. And again, this is why I'm telling you, don't, don't pinpoint people on small things, because they may, put, you know, don't put baby in a corner. They may, yeah. So wait, what's the difference between this, this and a denial of the victim? It's extending it further. So the denial of the victim, so using a less funny example, let's say, okay, I hit you, but you're not really hurt. Um, that would be denying the victim. So it's saying you're not really a victim in that case. Um, so I stole the cookie, but does, do you really care about the stupid cookie? Is it really important? Um, the person then, if they're still pressed, may go into the blaming of them. Um, so it's just, it's just an extension of that, really. So denial of victim is pretty much saying, oh, it wasn't really bad, but condemning the condemner is pretty much saying you deserve it. Yes. So it, the reason why I gave the, the blend is it usually phases from that to that. So think of if you're in an argument with someone, and then you say, well, yeah, I took your thing, but but you don't really use it, and you're also like an asshole, and da 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 da. And so it's it's that rage moment going the one level further. Um, so usually you would start there. Um, you would start with like neutralizing, 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 and then the anger when you're like, okay, fine, I'm caught, and I know that this wasn't that bad, or I just want this over, but you're still pressing me, and now I'm gonna like turn it personal. Um, so there's a funny example, a funny little video just I have on this. Um, and again, these are things we all do. And, that, and I think I like the, the order of them because that, that is usually how arguments escalate. Um, and, and so, you know, if you really want to be sociological, you can like map out how people transition between those when you're trying to annoy them or something. Um, I don't recommend that. Or maybe I do actually. But make notes if you're, for me if you're doing that. So this is a student video, so you guys can all do this. This is hilarious. Yeah, so it's four no real victims working. 
Yeah, see, can have, that's, who says reading can't be fun, right? Um, oh yeah, and so, sorry, uh, again, the, um, the appeal to higher loyalties was again, um, so you go through the whole anger arc and then the appeal to higher loyalties, so none of that's working, then it's like, well, actually I was doing this for someone else. What was I supposed to do? Um, so this one is quite, this is the last resort one usually. Um, it doesn't always have to go in this order. This one can come first, right? So um, if you think of someone saying, well, yeah, I gave you, you know, a failing grade in this class, but the prof told me to be really hard. Um, right, Jason? So you can use that when, uh, no, I'm joking, right? Right? So, right now. <laughs> right? So, I was just, whoa, whoa, I, what do you, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was, I was just doing what they wanted, right? Um, so, you could use that first, you could use that last, right? Right? So, um, a, a horrible example of that, um, not funny, is, is people that are responsible for uh, big cultural genocides often. So, Nazi Germany, um, this is the one that was used uh, in the Eichmann trial. So, the famous uh, Hannah Arendt uh, wrote about the banality of evil, uh, which was the argument basically that um, many genocides such as um, the Holocaust were a product not of individual evil necessarily. I mean, there's Hitler and stuff involved, but, but the most of the murder happening was happening by bureaucrats who were appealing to higher loyalties. Um, and they, you know, she demanded, like many others, obviously, their punishment, um, but they were, they were constantly justifying themselves, saying, well, I was just following orders, so I didn't know what I was doing. And it's like, really? You had no idea that, that pushing this button was sending a chain of, 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 of soldiers out um, or saying, well, I was a soldier. I was following orders. Um, so, so this can be quite severe. It can also be funny like the, like the uh, Jason example. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so ultimately, again, and these are serious debating points, right? So um, I'm ending a bit early so I can get back the test and talk about the essay. Um, We'll see for the next few weeks, the central question that we'll be asking is, you know, to what extent do you really think someone that's engaging in crime or deviance has differentially associated? So they're living this out. This is what they want to do. Or are they maybe flirting with deviance and neutralizing things as they go? Um, and I think, you know, they apply to different things, right? So think of Ted Bundy. He's a fabulous example of both of these things at the same time, right? Because Clearly, someone that, that's gone that far and is killing over 30 people, he's differentially associated to some extent. But why it works is that he just seems so normal. And not only normal, he seems like successful and attractive and all of these things. And so people are shocked when they think, well, how is he doing this? Um, so, so he's someone that, you know, it, it's hard to categorize as either of these. Um, Eileen Wuornos from Monster, the person I, I, I talk about quite a bit, um, she, she's another example of someone that's hard to categorize. So yes, she that she becomes this vigilante, um, killing men. But then when pressed, um, she says, "Well, what was I supposed to do? I was I've been forced into the sex trade. Basically, um, my family rejected me. All of these things, which were true. And in her mind, she's kind of going back and forth between these positions. Um, so again, I think the rest of the course, you, you know, we'll be looking at all sorts of different topics. But um, this, now that I've explained these, I think this really opens up a lot of topics for you for, for the research essay. Um, and these are ones that are probably the most popular that, that people use. They usually combine these, one of these with, uh, with other ones, um, like, like social control and strains usually quite popular. Um, but these theories open up these sort of more um, identity-based and culturally-based um, decisions to deviate. So again, someone that gets a bunch of face tattoos or whatever, are they really trying to defy society or um, are they you know, at one moment of their life, did it, did it just make sense to them that like, okay, if I want to be successful and have friends, um, I'm not going to get them the legitimate way, so I'm going to get them through my face tattoos with the subculture. Um, am I really a hardened anti-law person, um, or am I just someone looking for social connections? Um, and then am I neutralizing my deviance as I'm going? Um, so for the essay again, so it's it's uh, due July 16th. So we have um, about three weeks. 
Um, the, the class is going by so fast. Um, so I want you to use at least, I, I say at least, but there's no expectation that you use more than two. Um, I just put the at least because sometimes people want to use more, but there's no, there's, you won't do better or worse if you use more or less. Um, but two is, is what I'm expecting. Um, and um, oh, sorry. Why do I have previous proposed? That was I, I deleted the proposal because I uh, I didn't want. Um, yeah. Oops. Yeah, that was what I said, because um, we're doing part of that tomorrow, so I don't want you to think there's a formal essay proposal. Um, yeah, I changed, I changed that last minute in the course. Um, okay, sorry, good thing I saw that. <laughs> I'm normal, I see, I'm, I'm, I'm neutralizing my deviance. I'm like, no, 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 I didn't just copy and paste this from, um, well, I made this for this class, so I didn't, uh, anyway. They don't have, you can, you can look on, online, they don't have a, a, I never do an essay proposal. I was thinking of doing it. Um, okay, so you can focus on a general crime or something specific. Um, Jason already asked me about the, uh, and, and a student asked me about how specific you need to be um, about locating your, your topic in time and space and all of that. Um, you don't have to go in big details about that, but, um, but here I just have, you know, define your topic and explain how long it's been considered crime or deviant. So that's just to make sure um, that Jason knows exactly what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, if you're talking about sex work, for example, um, in Toronto, you would probably want to discuss briefly how sex work has become you know increasingly decriminalized but it's still seen as deviant um, for a variety of reasons um, if you're talking about um, you know video game playing like being a pro gamer um, you know you'd want to talk about how that wasn't really a thing 30 or 40 years ago and it's increasingly so now um, so just giving us some sense that, uh, of what you're talking about um, so for example, again, there's so many things students have done in the past. They've done burglars, murderers, they've done case studies of like one person. So you could do Ted Bundy if you want, um, Eileen Wernos. Um, you could do gang members, you could do white collar criminals. So people like Conrad Black, um, Martha Stewart, um, you could, or, or groups of that. So the, it's really totally up to you. The, the, the key of, in this essay though is showing us, so every lecture I'm usually trying to do this, um, showing us that you are combining two theories that you believe are both necessary to explain the topic at hand. So what that means is you have to prove to us that not only do each of those theories make sense to the topic, but that together they give a better account than either alone. Um, so if I, again, if I wanted to study my mother, let's just use the, use the example of my mother leaving, and that's her act of deviance, uh, her leaving the family. Um, um, I could I could view it through strain because she did have a strained relationship with my dad and all these things. I could view it through social control. I could view it through whatever. Um, I would likely view it through differential association theory and techniques of neutralization. Um, and I would say I need both of these theories because I know, um, obviously this wouldn't be argumentative in an essay, but I personally know my mother did not fully differentially associate, that she's still very normal and law-abiding, um, but that she's also developed all these quirky neutralizing habits. And so I would say she somehow neutralized her own differential association um, by, by seeing, well, I actually haven't left my family. They, they left me, and I'm making up for this, and da 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 um, so, so that's just one example. Um, but you could combine something like strain theory with self-control by saying, you know, I'm looking at gang members. They've often been studied um, through, um, through strain theory, saying, you know, people uh, are likely to engage in economic crimes when they're, when they're uh, you know, because of the American dream and not having access to it, um, but I really think it also has to do with self-control. Um, not, And that's how you can explain why some people become very law-abiding, most people in, the, in marginalized communities, but others don't. Some have self-control or impulsivity issues. Um, that could then lead you to look at biosocial theories or whatever. Um, so, so those, so I'll talk. We'll talk more about this, and Jason will talk more about this tomorrow. Of structuring your essay, getting your ideas out, and all of that. Um, but it should be fun. And the, again, the purpose of it, from an evaluate, from an evaluating perspective, um, is really just seeing how well you use two theories together. Um, so again, for an excellent grade, um, arguments clear. 
uh, co cogent, meaning like tight um, and to the point. You explain the chosen criminal behavior uh, or deviant behavior clearly, and you explain the theories clearly, and you connect the theory and the act. So again, the act of leaving, the act of whatever it is, um, in, a, in an analytically compelling way, meaning we know why you chose the theories. It doesn't just seem random, like the most random. If you just said, oh, I'm studying this using um, positivism and rational choice theory um, because they both you know, make sense or whatever. Um, that's too broad. So you could use those, but you would need to say exactly why. Because um, positivistic theory shows how the person was pushed into it, but because they weren't totally pushed, I think I see some rational choice, and it's rational choice, not self-control, da da da. Like, think about it and try to, com try to compel yourself. Um, and again, that's what I, that, that's how you do good work, you think. Are you convincing yourself um, of this argument, or does it seem kind of, eh, you know, just kind of obvious or kind of um, uninteresting? Again, you don't have to be saying totally new things, but it's more just um, re remember you're in a course and you're being evaluated based on A, how well you understand the theories, and B, how well you can use them in a meaningful way. Um, so there's no big surprises uh, in terms of what we're looking for. Um, Okay, so if you have any questions, you can ask me now. Um, otherwise, I will be, um, you can remain seated and I will hand out the tests. Do you need an attendance sheet? Um, oh, well, okay. Yeah, so I will hand that out while I'm doing this. Perfect. Thank you for reminding me. I have to buy more of those little cards. Uh.